Hi, welcome to another Just Traveling Through video. I'm Celeste. And I'm Terry. And today we're just traveling through the Loire Valley in France. We are going to explore 12 magnificent chateaux in the Loire Valley. We'll give you an itinerary and the information you need to explore this region on your own. From the grandeur and immensity of Chateau Chambord to the elegance of Chateau Chenonceau. Each chateau possesses its own unique charm and history, and that is a thing that we thought was really interesting. Each one was so unique that it never got boring. Yeah, you never feel like, oh my God, not another chateau, because they're all so amazing on their own. If you like what you see, consider subscribing or sending us a super thanks to buy us a cup of coffee. We did our visit in the Loire Valley from west to east. We decided that we needed to have three base camps in the Loire Valley, which would allow us to not have to drive more than perhaps 50 kilometers to any one chateau. So we selected Anger, Chenon, and Amboise as the places that would allow us to follow that strategy, and it worked quite well. We also never planned to see more than two chateaus in a day. Yeah, by the time you have properly explored a chateau, you're going to be there between two and maybe three hours. So if you had a lunch in and then another chateau, you've pretty much used up the entire day. Our first base camp was Angers, and from Angers we explored Chateau d'Angers, Chateau Brissac, and Chateau Brise. If you arrive in Angers by train, you will be less than a kilometer from the chateau, so it's an easy stroll. There's plenty of lodging right in town. There is parking available at the chateau. There is a small lot on the southwest corner containing about 25 to 30 slots. If that parking lot is full, there is parking in the area on the city streets. Side streets. You may have to be inventive, but there are some out there. Tickets are available either online or on site, and it's open year-round. This was a beautiful and massive chateau founded in the 9th century by the Counts of Anjou. It was expanded to its current size in the 13th century. It is located overhanging the River Main, and it has been a listed historical monument since 1875. The chateau is home to the Apocalypse Tapestry Collection, the largest medieval tapestry in the world, dating back to the 14th century. It's a masterpiece of medieval art, and it was a really cool exhibit. This was originally a Roman-built fortress, and later rebuilt and expanded by Count Fulk III. The fortress was heavily damaged during World War II, subsequently rebuilt by the French government. And I mentioned massive earlier. When you realize the outer walls are 10 feet thick and the towers were originally 130 feet tall, it gives you some idea of the massiveness of this structure. The next chateau on our list is Chateau Brissac, known as the Giant of the Loire Valley. Tickets for Chateau de Brissac can be purchased right as you walk in at the entry gate. There is quite a bit of parking available in a public lot just around the corner from the chateau. There are spaces for probably 50 to 60 vehicles and room for campers as well. There was no restaurant on site, but there was like a little place to get coffee and snacks inside behind the Yeah, counter. right behind the entrance uh, cashier where you pay to get in. This chateau was originally built in the 11th century by the Counts of Anjou. The property is now owned by the Cosset family, whose head bears the French hereditary title of the Duke of Brissac. The chateau continues to be occupied by the family, but most of the building is open to the public. However, the owning family uh, allow two rooms to be utilized as bed and breakfast accommodations. It's also the tallest chateau in the Loire Valley. It's seven stories, and you can see right away when you walk into the property how tall it is. Given that this chateau was originally built in the 11th century, the condition is just amazing. Uh, everything's in really beautiful shape. When you, when you walk through, you feel like it's still a home. Next on our list is Chateau Brise. Chateau Brise is a dry-moated castle located in the town of Brise, France. Parking is ample and right out front of the chateau with room for campers. Tickets can be purchased online or at the front entrance to the chateau. This chateau dates back to the 11th century when it was originally built as a medieval fortress. The chateau was later transformed and expanded during the Renaissance period, showcasing both medieval and Renaissance architectural elements. But what really sets Chateau Brise apart is the extensive network of underground tunnels. 
These tunnels were initially quarries used to extract the stone that was used in the construction of the chateau. But over time, they were expanded to include living spaces, kitchens, and even a chapel, making the underground complex of tunnels an integral part of the chateau. In addition to the underground tunnels, the moat around the chateau was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's one of the, in fact, I, th I think it is the deepest dry moat in, uh, in France. From there, we moved on to our next base camp, which was in Chenon. The town of Chenon was a really nice place to stay as a base camp. Yeah, it's a very small village. It's uh, very walkable. In fact, uh, quite a few of the streets in the old town section are pedestrian only. As you can see here in the video, uh, we're here early in the morning, so not a lot is open, but in the afternoons, there's cafes, there's grocery store, there's all kinds of amenities. It gets more vibrant as the day wears on. Chenon was our game plan to allow us to visit the Chateau d'Ussay, Chateau d'Azé le Redieu, and Chateau de Villandry, in addition to the Chateau Chenon, which is right in town. As you can see in the image above, you can see why we chose Chenon as our base camp because it was very close to the chateaus we wanted to visit. There are several choices for parking in town. There is an elevator that takes you from the town of Chenon up to the chateau. You can park at the base of the elevator, which is a pay parking lot with a small number of spaces. You can also park in the town where there are several free lots and walk through and take the elevator. Additionally, there's a parking lot on the hill on the north side of town that doesn't require taking the elevator. Or you can actually walk up from town. So yeah, it gets many it, options. It gets steep at the, t at the end. Tickets are available online or at the entrance, and there is a cafe on site for light fare. Yep. The chateau and the village of Chenot are located on the banks of the River Vienne, 10 kilometers from where it joins the Loire River. It was founded by Theobald I, Count of Blois. King Philip II seized it in 1205. The castle was initially constructed as a fortress, and over the centuries it has undergone various architectural transformations. The Chateau is a complex of three castles, each with its own unique character and history. The Chateau Fort is the oldest part of the castle and is home to the castle's donjon or keep. The Chateau du Milieu was built in the 12th century and is home to the castle's royal apartments. The Chateau du Courre was built in the 15th century and is home to the castle's gardens. Chenon is also famous for being the place where Joan of Arc met with Charles VII, the Dauphin of France, in 1429. This historic meeting marked a turning point in the Hundred Years' War and ultimately led to Joan of Arc's military campaign to lift the siege of Orléans. Moving on to Chateau Doucet, the chateau that inspired the castle in Sleeping Beauty. Parking. There is a large parking lot adjacent to the Chateau Estate. The parking lot is big. As you can see, there's room for buses and campers, and there's a little cafe just outside the front entrance to the chateau. It was originally built as a stronghold in the Middle Ages, but has been developed over time to become a jewel of Renaissance architecture. It later became a splendid residential home in the 17th and 18th centuries. It's known for its striking resemblance to the castle depicted in the Charles Perrault fairy tale Sleeping Beauty, the castle's turreted spires, drawbridge, and picturesque location by the Indra River contribute to its fairy tale charm. A lot of the rooms were decorated depicting the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale. So this is a good one if you go with children because there's a lot of yeah, they'll enjoy it. mannequins that are dressed up like the queen. And it, there's... it kind of brought the rooms to life to see all the mannequins and, and the period costumes and The chateau was built during the reign of King Francis I in the early 16th century. It's considered one of the earliest examples of French Renaissance style. There is a very large and free parking lot adjacent to the village. Tickets are available online or at the entrance, and there were some restaurants in the area, as you can see from the map. The chateau was built between 1518 and 1527. 
It's set on an island in the middle of the Indre River and is picturesque and has become one of the most popular of the Chateau of the Loire Valley. The uh, visitors have been notable, among them being King Philip II of France, who once met Richard the Lionheart of England to discuss peace. As you can see, it was raining when we went, but we still had a pretty good visit. <laughs> Bring your umbrellas, just be, in case. Yeah, be prepared. Next on the list is Chateau de Villandry. This chateau is located on the Cher River and is renowned for its stunning Renaissance gardens, which are considered some of the most beautiful in France. Parking is just across from the chateau. It's free, and the tickets can be found online or in the entrance to the chateau. There is a small terrace restaurant on site, and there are a number of smaller restaurants in the village. This is one of the most visited chateaus in France in 2022. They received over 500,000 visitors that year. So you can see from this image how extensive the gardens are surrounding the chateau. Yeah, they're quite large, over 22 acres. They have six distinct gardens. A water garden. With ponds and fountains, an ornamental garden with intricate patterns of clipped box filled with different flowers according to the seasons. And an enormous vegetable garden. There's even a maze for the kids. This, yeah, we could just stand there and, and look at the gardens for hours. Yeah, so. they were beautiful. Everywhere you looked, there was use, use of color, use of of structure look at it look at this picture here it's just an amazing uh, backdrop we read later that they employ like over a dozen full-time gardeners yeah you want to give yourself plenty of time to explore the gardens and make sure you hydrate before you go so if it's hot you can stay outside well the gardens are the real main attraction the interior of the chateau is also worth exploring it features elegantly decorated rooms, including a splendid Renaissance kitchen. One of my, I think this was maybe my second or third favorite castle. Maybe yeah, my this, second. This is a beautiful spot. The okay. gardens alone are worth the trip. From Chinon, we moved on to base camp number three, Amboise. From this base camp, we could see the final five chateaux on our game plan. Chateau d'Amboise, Chavigny, Chambord, Chenonceau, and chaumont sur loire You can see on the map here the distances between Amboise and the different chateaux. So it's, uh, we didn't do more than two in a day. We stayed here several days, but this gives you an idea and you can see them in any order that you want and it, you know, plan your days depending on weather. Yeah, once you have a base camp selected, you're, you know, you're, you have some flexibility as to the routes and how you want to see these different chateaux. Chateau d'Amboise was next on our list. It's perched high on a hill over the village and offers amazing views of the Loire River. It's famous for its association with Leonardo da Vinci, who was buried in the nearby chapel of St. Hubert. Parking for the chateau was a little more difficult. There's parking in areas around the town. There was a parking lot along the waterfront that was a pay parking place. So this one, you might want to try to get there early to avoid having challenges with parking. It's a very popular place to visit, and these parking places go fast. There's also a lot of restaurants in that area, so once you walk up and visit that chateau, you can walk down and plan to have lunch or afternoon snack or dinner right there in town. It's a really pretty town along the river. Entrance tickets are available online or at the entrance to the chateau. The original building was constructed in the 8th or 9th century and was later expanded and rebuilt by Charles VIII in the 1495 time frame. King Francis I was raised there and King Charles VIII died there. History says that he died in 1498 after hitting his head on a door lintel. The chateau fell into decline from the second half of the 16th century and the majority of the interior buildings were later demolished, but some survived and have been restored along with the outer defensive circuit of towers and walls. It has been recognized as a monument history by the French Ministry of Culture since 1840. Next on the list is Cheverny. This chateau was built over several decades during the 17th century, so it's one of the later chateaux in the valley. Parking was easy and available right on site. 
very large and free. Tickets are available only at the entrance. They're not available online. There's also a cafe on site. You can see from their map above that there's not only the chateau, but there's parks, gardens, picnic areas, and the maze, in addition to the kennels. Chateau de Giverny was one of the first chateaus to be open to the public in 1922. It's also famous for its pack of hunting dogs, a tradition that continues to this day. The kennels, which were created in 1850, where more than 100 tricolor Anglo-French dogs live, they are a cross of English foxhound and French pot You can hear the dogs barking as you're Everywhere. walking around. <laughs> yeah. On the website, they even have the ability to suggest a name for one of the dogs. The de Vibray family currently operates the estate and it has been in the same family for over six centuries. It is renowned for magnificent interiors and its collection of furniture, tapestries, and art. The coat of arms room was especially fascinating to visit. Next on the list is Chateau de Chenonceau. The estate of Chenonceau is first mentioned in writing in the 11th century. The current chateau was built in the 1514 to 1522 time frame on the foundations of an old mill and was later extended to span the river. There is a large parking lot adjacent to the estate. And tickets are available online. And since this is one of the more heavily visited chateaus, the tickets are timed entry tickets. So look at the site to make sure you understand the requirements for the tickets before you go. There's a self-service restaurant and creperie and a wine tasting at the Cave des Dômes right on site. Chateau de Chenonceau is often referred to as the Ladies' Castle due to the significant influence of several women in its history. Catherine Briconet was the originator of the chateau's construction. She was the wife of Thomas Bohier, who was the royal chamberlain and the owner of the estate in the early 16th century. It was under Catherine's direction that the first elements of the chateau were built, including the arch bridge over the Cher River. Perhaps the most famous lady associated with the chateau is Diane de Poitiers, the mistress of King Henry II. After the death of Thomas Boyer, the castle was ceded to the crown, and the king ended up giving the chateau to his mistress so that he could focus on Chambord. Now, after the death of King Henry II, Chenonceau passed to his widow, Catherine de' Medici, removing it from the ownership of Diane de Poitiers. Catherine de' Medici then continued the development of the chateau and was responsible for the construction of the Grand Gallery, which became a cultural and social center in her time. During World War I, the Grand Gallery of the Chateau was used as a hospital facility to treat wounded soldiers. The chateau's strategic location with its spacious gallery made it suitable for such purposes and provided a crucial service during the conflict. Then in World War II, the chateau was used for both protecting and valuable art and helping people escape danger. The chateau's strategic location on the Cher River formed a demarcation line between occupied and unoccupied France. The drawbridge of Chenonceau provided a discreet means for people to cross the river often helping members of the French resistance and individuals in danger to escape from the occupied zone to the relative safety of the unoccupied zone. This is one of the coolest aspects of the chateau when we visited, was looking at the history, which they have very well laid out in the gallery. Yeah, the gallery is, is almost like a, uh, a historical display of, of many of the owners and what they did and who they were and what they did to the property. It's, it's quite interesting. On to Chateau de Chambord. This is the largest chateau in France and the most visited with over 800,000 visitors per year. The estate is 13,000 acres and the chateau is comprised of 440 rooms, 335 fireplaces, 12 staircases and 70 main stairs laid out over an area of 200,000 square feet in the building alone. There's a very large parking lot on site adjacent to the estate. It's a pay parking lot. Tickets are available online. They are not date specific, but good for a period of time. You can also purchase tickets at the entrance to the, to the chateau. There are restaurants on the site, gift shops, wine shops. There's a lot of facilities. Being one of the largest visited sites, there's tons of stuff to do and see. During our trip research, we discovered that Chambord was originally constructed by Francis I as a hunting lodge. 
Can you imagine something that large being just a hunting lodge? Yet when you realize that at the time he was living at his residences at the Chateau de Blois and Amboise, this was like his second home or third home or fifth home. But right, just some place to get away and do a little hunting. All of the chateau is available to be seen. As we mentioned earlier, there are over 400 rooms, but only 60 are available to be seen as you traverse this building. It's so massive. One of the more fascinating things about Chambord is just looking at the architecture itself. There's st spiral staircases on each of the corners. Yeah, the spiral staircases are, are unique. They are a double helix construction method where there's one going up and one coming down and they they interleave there's a lot of evidence that leonardo da vinci influenced the design because of drawings they found after leonardo's death in addition to the inside spaces there's a lot of ground to cover on the outside as well you could easily spend an entire day yeah there's a huge garden there's a canal boat ride there's a, as we mentioned earlier there are shops if you only have time to see one chateau, I'd say this is the one to see. And last but certainly not least, chaumont sur loire This historic castle is characterized by its striking turreted design. The parking for this one was a little tricky for us. We actually didn't know where to turn. If you go, if you're on the main drag and you find the Rue du Chateau, that's the road that goes up to the castle. Even there, there's no sign, or we didn't see a sign. That's the road you take to get to the big parking lot out front of the uh, chateau. Yeah, it looks a little narrow, and it goes straight up the hill, and it's the only way to get to the parking lot, so that's where you need to be. There are two restaurants on site, a buffet style, and then a more fancy restaurant. Uh, the buffet style we thought was very good. It was very pleasant sitting out in the garden. Yeah, we had lunch here. It was quite good. Tickets can be found online or at the entrance. They are undated tickets, so can be used from May to October. You can see the turret style here. It's very stunning to, to look at. It's the one, one of the more fairy tale chateaus or castles that we saw, I think. Besides which, you're, on, you're high up on a cliff above the river and above the village, so the views are quite good. And you can see the gardens here as well. They're, they have special garden shows throughout the year. They have an international garden festival in the Chateau's extensive gardens. This renowned event showcases innovative and artistic garden designs from creators around the world and provides a unique and immersive experience for visitors who can explore the diverse and creative garden installation. There was also a stables, I believe, that yeah. you could visit, and it was another one where you could spend a short amount of time or a lot of time, depending on how De much you wanted to see. Depending on how slow you're walking. <laughs> this is not the end. We have another video that shows you more information about where the Loire is and information for getting around, rules of the road. Useful information that we found useful ourselves and uh, sharing it with you guys. So happy planning your Loire Valley trip. It's well worth the effort. We encourage you to go and have a good time.